Well, welcome back to Palipidology. Um, going through the different soil orders of what used to be the U.S. Department of Agriculture and is now NCR National Resource Conservation Council. Um, we got up to uh, last time we did aridosols um, with the saguaro cactuses, uh, what you find in um, Arizona. Today, let's do start with mollusols, one of my favorites, mollusols. Um, and they're one of my favorites because um, they were puzzling for a long, long uh, time how on earth um, to recognize these in the fossil uh, record because uh, key features are not usually well preserved um, in them. Um, they all end in OLL, so we have Ustal, um, Zeral. Oh, this would be a dry climate one with a, a summer dry climate like we have here in Eugene. Oh, this would be a dry climate with um, some wet um, climate. Um, the more common name for mollusols is Chernitzum. And some people like these old-fashioned names too, Chernitzum, Podzol. Um, these actually go back to the Russian uh, underpinnings of um, soil science. Uh, the Chernitzum was actually the very beginning of soil science, really. The idea that the Chernozem was a soil that was created by a particular ecosystem rather than a geological deposit was something that was put forward in a really amazing monograph in 1883 by um, Dokuchev. Um, before him, um, people had thought that soils were just weathered rock um, and you had a sort of a weathered rock model for the formation of soils. Dokuchev uh, showed really convincingly that there are certain features of soils that are ecosystem uh, specific, that soil is a thing in itself, not just a modified or weathered, or weathered rock. Um, a pretty classical um, kind of a profile for a mollusol uh, looks like this. Um, these are the grassland soils of the great grasslands of the Northern Hemisphere in particular, particularly sod grassland uh, soils, um, which have a very dense mat of um, roots that you can actually um, roll up like a carpet and then transport to recreate um, a lawn. Uh, mollusols have a characteristic um, surface horizon which is called an epipedon. This is a mollic epipedon. Um, which is um, really pretty distinctive. Um, it has to be at least 18 centimeters thick uh, in a modern soil. Um, if you have a molecapapetron that's thinner than that, then it's some sort of inceptosol or um, entosol or some other kind of a soil. Uh, the molecapapetron is a very distinctive um, horizon uh, that has crump heads. I've talked about these before, and you saw some examples of them. Uh, tiny, uh, about three millimeters or so, long, um, a little bit um, less than three millimeters in, in vertical height. Um, they're like um, Rice Krispies, or um, what they really are, though, is the fecal pellets of uh, earthworms. Um, and um, they also form um, in this very fine structure because the roots of grasses are also very tiny and the roots break up the soil into, uh, into units. The thing about these crumb heads that makes them really quite remarkable is that they have an organic rind. And then inside that, there is a smectite clay, a clay uh, which is quite rich uh, in um, nutrients, particularly sodium, magnesium, potassium. Uh, smectite clay would normally be very unstable, and I'll talk about an unstable clay soil um, next, um, another one of my favorites. Um, but what happens in a mollusol is that the action of earthworms and the action of grasses uh, and their fine roots uh, putting exudates into the spaces uh, between the peds uh, stabilizes this structure. Uh, it is really quite a distinctive uh, structure. Um, the whole thing is organic, 
um, about 10 percent organic carbon. Um, it's it's usually quite dark, um, a very dark brown, or even uh, black uh, in color in a modern soil. Uh, in a fossil soil, however, this organic material is not always um, all that well uh, preserved. Um, in a fossil example, um, we can have uh, the disappearance of all that organic material once it's buried and below the water table and the soil microbiome is just chewing it up. Um, but uh, in all mollusks, we can recognize in the fossil world, but we do have these crumb heads, this crumb ped structure, um, which indicates a very strong conditioning of the, um, of the, uh, of the soil um, with fine roots and um, earthworms. Um, they generally tend to be uh, relatively rich in nutrients, uh, uh, eutrophic in other words. Um, they can have a bunch of other, so the molecular pepperon is the main thing. That's the main thing to recognize a mollusol. They can also have some other uh, horizons, usually quite thin, like a BT. So this would be clay. Um, or um, calcareous nodules, like so. This would be a BK. I'm going to put this in parentheses because it's not necessary. That's caliche or calcite uh, nodules. Um, or um, they can have um, gypsum crystals. That would be a BY uh, gypsum or other salts. Uh, and then down below that, there's a C, which is just weathered material. Um, these soils are quite um, the most fertile soils on, um, on the planet. Um, they are very base rich. Um, this is base rich material. And you can grow just about anything in them uh, with uh, CA2 plus, MG2 plus, NA plus, K plus, um, all of these materials in a fairly freely available form um, in the organic matter, which is quite rich. Um, they also tend to be moist because they have a lot of organic matter in them, and that holds uh, soil um, moisture. Um, it's no accident that almost all of the farming agriculture of uh, the world is in mollusols. Uh, these are the sorts of soils that are easily cultivated. Uh, you have to bust the sod, of course, um, to plow them, which has been done very, very uh, widely. Uh, fertile, well-structured, stable. They can take machinery on them, um, although um, if you, that's um, actually um, subject to abuse in certain cases. Um, these are the soils that are pretty much the breadbaskets of the world. Uh, these are the soils that stretch through a good part of the American Midwest, uh, from uh, Illinois all the way up to um, the distal part of Kansas and the eastern part of Colorado. Uh, they extend in a great belt uh, in the northern hemisphere uh, from um, Moscow uh, south uh, almost to the Black Sea. Um, there are a few areas of this um, in parts of India and in China, although not too much. Uh, and um, the grasslands of East Africa in particular have a lot of these uh, mollusols. There was a time when people thought that they weren't mollusols in East Africa and that tropical soils had to be quite different. But uh, studies by um, the Dutch soil scientists out of Wageningen have shown, no, these are just ordinary um, mollusols and are part of that great grassland ecosystem. There are mollusols also in South America, uh, particularly uh, in Buenos Aires province of Argentina, uh, extending out into Uruguay, um, and then down a little way toward Patagonia, although they're not too far in that uh, direction. These are the breadbasket of the world. No native mollusols in Australia. Uh, in Australia, the mollusols were introduced along with livestock and along with grasses um, as a part of an agricultural um, enterprise. The Australian um, mollusols are uh, created by humans trying to recreate um, the productivity and the um, kinds of soil texture that we get in the African savanna or in the American Midwest. Um, Native Australian mammals are not like sheep and cattle, which have liquid manures that um, will um, condition the soil in a way that ends up forming a, 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 a mollusol. Very interesting kind of a soil type. Not that old, um, as we'll see.
um, the model cells can only be traced back um, around about um, 20 million years uh, before present. Um, Molly uh, means, by the way, soft. It's, it's from the Latin um, mollus, which means uh, soft. Uh, because it, this is a living carpet, really. Uh, and uh, it's um, very easy to walk on. It's not quite bouncy, but it's very easy to walk on, uh, soft. And it tends to form a, a layer which subdues uh, topography and buries rocks and other um, artifacts. Charles Darwin wrote a lovely uh, book about that, uh, the action of worms in creating uh, mollusols in parts of the British uh, Midlands. Uh, vertisol. Vertisols are the soils that turn. Uh, they actually um, heave. Uh, this means turn. This means soft. Uh, and they um, they all end in urt. So we have udurt, for example. This would be a, um, a very uh, wet climate um, vertisol. Um, another word for vertisols is swelling clay soils. These are the sorts of soils that have smectite, but not necessarily um, conditioned um, by the um, grasses or um, earthworms. They have a lot of clay, and so they tend to be relatively um, unstable. Uh, they're found in um, many parts of the world, um, uh, East Africa, India, uh, Texas. Um, we have uh, quite a number of them in Australia. And um, the real characteristic of them uh, is a set of really distinctive structures. Uh, normally we find them in um, grassland uh, or savanna environments where you have scattered acacia trees, uh, relatively low grasses that aren't really conditioning things. Uh, and uh, they have this rather amazing structure at the surface, um, which is around um, uh, clastic dikes, uh, and um, which uh, is thrown into slick insides, uh, like so. Um, let's let's blow this up a little. Um, so we have um, cracks. They form in seasonally dry climates where there's uh, quite a strong dry season. Uh, during the dry season, this clay will shrink and uh, crack. There'll be open cracks and things will go down that crack. Um, and so the whole thing is basically moving. And you can see these lentil pits uh, that are formed uh, from the motion of uh, this shrinking and um, heaving uh, motion. Uh, these are called, these are slick and sided. Lentil pits. These individual lentil units are um, swelling when something falls down here and then it rains. So the whole thing is pushed apart. Um, and the slick insides form on the ped surfaces, and they are in these kind of lentil-like uh, uh, like units. Uh, they have an A horizon, a BT horizon, and a C horizon, which is better. Um, this is um, organic plus mineral. This is pretty much a really thick clay. Lots of clay um, in uh, in these. Um, this kind of structure is really beautifully preserved in the fossil record, uh, believe it or not. Um, we can see these things in cliffs. Uh, there's a classic example, 2.2 billion years old in South Africa, that shows these various uh, these various features. There are two ways of looking at the at the, at this um, cross-sectional view of a vertisol. One is from the point of view of a um, micro topography um, and this is called Gilgoy micro relief I've talked about this already it's this slight elevation change between the low part and the high part of the puff where the uh, stuff is falling down here and it expands it'll puff up 
uh, to form a kind of a ridge. Um, the ridges can be um, in the form of uh, melon holes, they can be uh, circular uh, holes or ponds, uh, or they can be a linear Gilgai where you get these parallel uh, troughs in the surface. Um, the a word Gilgai is an Aboriginal Australian word which means pond. After it rains, the whole soil becomes quite tight um, and expands, uh, and the rain ponds in these intervening uh, swales of the Gilgai structure uh, itself. So there's a micro relief to them, um, and there's also what we call Mukara structure. Mukara is this finger of material which is being uplifted uh, by the shrinking and swelling behavior of, um, of the clay. Um, the Mukara structure is this cracking and uplift of uh, the swells or the high points of the Gilgai microrelief. And sometimes you can see this uh, preserved in paleosols um, really quite, um, quite beautifully. Um, the, so we have the relief and we have the Mukara structure. Uh, this is by far and away the best indication of a vertisol in the fossil record, of course, because these things are really quite prominent. Um, this kind of subtle relief, which is just a few inches over uh, fairly large distances, is a lot uh, more difficult uh, to see. These soils are trouble with a capital T. Uh, it's very hard to build anything in them. Uh, it's very hard to put a road over them that will stay. It's very hard to put a foundation uh, for a building that will stay. They move when it, when it rains, and then they shrink open when it dries out. They are relatively unstable uh, soil. Nevertheless, they're quite good, uh, particularly for growing cotton. Uh, a lot of these soils are actually used to grow cotton crops, um, and um, in, uh, in many parts of the world, actually. Um, and a certain sorts of rangeland, not too bad. Um, the, the trees don't do well. Um, permanent buildings don't do well. Um, these are the sorts of soils that are engineering difficulties. Uh, they're not easy uh, to build on in any, in any way. But nevertheless, they are quite uh, fertile. Um, the reason why they shrink and swell, these are the swelling clay soils. The swelling clays are smectites is that the smectites are two to one layer clays that uh, will take in um, water on the interlayer to double or triple their, their thickness uh, when water is <coughs> available. These smectites are also um, very um, rich in nutrients, so they can be relatively uh, fertile on soils. A whole variety of crops are grown on them, um, not just cotton, but sorghum, um, wheat, and others. Um, they are, can be a problem. Uh, if you get rain when you want to harvest or plow, um, but um, many of them are used um, agriculturally and are quite important that way. So, mollusols and vertisols, they actually uh, often occur in um, similar areas, and the contrast between the two is quite striking. It's quite striking that um, the mollusol is so well conditioned um, by the grass that it is not unstable. Um, in a, a situation where the vegetation is not a sod grassland that can really condition the soil, then you get the vertisol and you get all those structural problems. Histosol. Um, histosol um, is a soil that is made of, um, of tissue, and uh, by this we mean uh, plant tissue. Um, they all end in IS, uh, fibrist, um, saprist. There's actually a continuum between these two. Uh, this has a lot of fiber that's recognizable, including um, plant fragments that you can recognize, leaves, bits of wood, um, other things like that. Um, this is um, really massive. It's just, it's just dark, decayed material. But it's organic matter, basically. Uh, histosols are the organic soils. Um, histosols have a profile that looks somewhat like this. They have um, a peculiar kind of vegetation that can tolerate um, waterlogging. Uh, not many vegetation types can tolerate waterlogging to the extent of uh, some of these uh, histosols. Um, a, a classic uh, plant for these uh, sorts of um, 
Sol's is Texodium, or Swamp Cypress, which you find in Florida um, and in the Okefenokee Swamp of, uh, of Georgia. Um, what happens here in the swampy environments uh, is that the individual um, plants are shedding branches and other material um, into an area where the water table is really quite high. Uh, these uh, taxodium plants can tolerate quite a degree of water logging, which is a, quite a trick because plants do need to respond. Um, and uh, these do have knee roots and air and and other adaptations, but still pretty impressive. Um, this surface horizon has to be at least 40 centimeters thick. Um, and this is what's called the histic epipedon. Um, that's an O horizon. It's basically a peat. I don't know if you've seen peat um, in bogs in Scotland or in uh, or in Ireland. Um, peat is um, very plant rich material. You can actually burn it in your fireplace, uh, and you can um, when it's dried out a little bit, um, and it makes a, a little crofter's cottage fairly cozy. Um, there are other horizons too. Uh, the roots tend to spread out. They don't tend to penetrate very deeply because there's no oxygen down there. So we have an A horizon, which is mineral plus organic. So now we've got roots going down into the clay. Um, there can be um, nodules. Uh, the nodules um, would be a BG. Not necessary for the definition. What you have to have to be a histosol is a 40 centimeter thick peat, basically, at least. A BG horizon could be made of glade minerals like siderite, FeCO3, or pyrite, uh, FeS. Siderite is formed in freshwater swampy environments um, that are relatively alkaline. Uh, pyrite is formed in mangrove type environments. Um, and then there's um, uh, a sea horizon, which is just weathered material uh, below that. Uh, it's kind of a delicate balance for histosols, as it turns out. Um, they have to be able to grow and get enough oxygen to the roots. Um, and uh, they're forming this rather thick peat, um, which has very few nutrients in it at all, and also hardly any oxygen. So it's very difficult for plants uh, to use. Um, these sorts of uh, salts are found only in about 2 to 3 percent of the world's uh, land area. Uh, the plants themselves have to adapt to rather difficult conditions of rising water um, and um, low nutrient uh, conditions. Uh, and so it's kind of a difficult sort of soil uh, for um, agriculture. Um, you can't plow it. Um, you can't really grow anything um, in it. Most of them are left uh, as uh, watersheds. Uh, in the rock record, of course, we have lots and lots of these. Um, it's basically a coal. So in the rock record, when the histosols are compacted, when they're buried by two or three kilometers, um, everything gets squashed together. Um, the uh, peat uh, has a certain number of volatile materials like um, nitrogen uh, that is driven off and sulfur driven off. Uh, and so they become richer and richer in carbon and become an increasingly um, intense or high calorific value uh, fuel. Um, the difficulty we have with um, identifying them in the, in the fossil record is that um, these peats are easily compactable. Um, after only about a kilometer or so of burial, uh, they compact to about a tenth of their uh, former thickness. So technically, a coal only four centimeters thick uh, would qualify as a uh, as a histosol. Um, people have mapped coal seams. Um, I mean, they're economically important. They're useful for all sorts of purposes, particularly for generating electricity and other uses. And so um, these are actually pretty well uh, documented and um, surveyed and it, and uh, analyzed um, different sorts of coals, um, the, uh, particularly the low sulfur ones with maybe siderite, not too much pyrite, um, these sorts of uh, coals are uh, of the best quality for burning. Otherwise, you tend to get a lot of sulfate uh, pollution um, into uh, the atmosphere when you burn uh, that sort of a uh, sort of a coal. Alpha sols. 
Alpha souls, uh, it's a funny term, really. Um, uh, it's, it's a combination of aluminum and, um, and iron. Um, and it, it's a confusing term in a way um, because um, there's also a kind of a soul called a pedalpha. A soul of iron and aluminum. Well, an alpha soul is not a pedalpha. Um, alpha souls are uh, not the same at all. Um, alpha souls have ALF endings. Westelf, for example, would be a dry climate one. Um, Westelf. Um, and it's, uh, they're pretty typically um, found under temperate deciduous forests, um, eutrophic or fertile forests. So you have an A horizon, mineral plus organic. Um, you have a, um, there can be an E horizon that is uh, alluvial or leached. Uh, a light colored kind of quartz or feldspar rich one. Um, there is always a very uh, strong uh, enrichment of clay. That would be a BT. This is what defines an alpha salt. Um, and this has to actually qualify as an argillic horizon. So that's about 10% more than the stuff above and below. 10% more clay in this zone here. That's um, so you can name a BT horizon in field terminology for just anything that's more clay than what's above or below it. But for it to be an alpha sol, it has to be has to qualify as um, argillic. It actually has to have um, around about um, eight to ten percent more clay. Now the the, the uh, qualify, qualifying um, limits uh, change a bit depending on the total uh, amount. Of, uh, of, of clay, but that's the basic idea. Um, we think they form because the root traces are tapering down, the root traces go down in here, they're quite stout up in here, and they're delivering clay uh, by alluviation. So it's an alluvial, alluvial, meaning washing down um, of um, clay to create a clay enriched uh, horizon. They also base rich. So we're going to have clays like smectite, um, clays that are rich in plant uh, nutrients. Um, and then there's a, there's a C down in here. Um, you can sometimes, at quite a depth, get calcareous nodules, usually more than a meter down. Uh, not a necessary horizon, so this is calcareous. And this is just weathered. An alpha sol. The classic uh, vegetation of an alpha sol is um, oak forest, uh, deciduous oak forest. Um, the deciduous habit is what uh, keeps the um, rather spectacular um, fertility of these sols. Uh, you can grow most things in them. Um, you may need to amend them with um, organic fertilizer in order to have a market garden um, on them. But they're, they're, they're quite fertile uh, soils. They're not um, really strongly leached of um, all the good uh, nutrients that, um, that you would need uh, for a um, agricultural um, enterprise. Ultrasol. Now, there's a problem with ultrasol in that it's actually quite hard to distinguish them from um, alpha sols. It's a bit hard to distinguish alpha sols from aridosols too. Um, the alpha sols will have a very deep calcic horizon. The aridosols have a rather shallow um, one. Ultrasols have a, a kind of a um, kind of a, a, a soil profile that can look exactly like an alpha sol. Uh, generally speaking, the vegetation is a little bit different. It usually will have some conifers. Maybe have, it'll have some broadleaf uh, plants in it as well. Um, there'll be an A. Uh, mineral plus organic. Uh, there can be an E. Uh, that one is um, not um, necessary. So I'm putting it in parentheses here. Um, an alluvial horizon, uh, rich in uh, feldspar and um, maybe quite a bit of, uh, of quartz. Uh, then there's a strong BT again. 
BT, clay. It has to qualify as argillic, meaning 8 to 10 percent more clay than what's above and uh, below it. But the difference in an altosol is that they are base poor. They are less fertile. Udolt is an example. They all end in alt, um, which sort of means um, ultimate. Um, what we see uh, in the eastern United States, in particular where these were first defined, is a progression of uh, steady depletion of nutrients over time. These soils tend to be older. Um, they also tend to have um, a vegetation which is rather more uh, acidic uh, and less rich in weatherable uh, materials. Uh, and so they tend to be quite a bit more infertile. Uh, you clear these and it's actually quite hard to get a market garden um, going. Uh, these are the sorts of soils that instead of having um, smectites, will have kaolinite. Kaolinite is the kind of a clay which is pretty much pretty close in composition to Al2O3, just an aluminum oxide um, in, uh, in sheets. Um, the uh, altosol is an older kind of a soil uh, that is now leached of nutrients, usually because um, it um, has been weathered for a longer uh, period of time uh, than uh, the um, alpha cell. Um, and we tend to get more of the conifers, uh, the acidic uh, kinds of uh, plants uh, in this sort of a habitat. So um, that's an alpha cell, um, such as an udult. There are lots of udults around the world um, in um, Gondwana countries, uh, in Brazil, um, in India, in Australia, um, in tropical areas especially, um, where the tropical weathering regime is pretty intense, where there's a strong um, bleaching, where there are relatively high temperatures uh, that are um, really uh, starting to weather everything to a thick, thick clay. Spodosol. Now we have a soil which is uh, not too common in the fossil record, but very common in the modern world, which is kind of interesting. Um, a spodosol um, is um, actually not this, not equal to um, podsol. Uh, podsol actually means under ash, um, meaning it's uh, got a very um, well-developed uh, eluvial horizon. That's what a podsol is. A spodosol is not that at all. A spodosol is something that has an iron or organic rich subsurface horizon. One that's rich in iron would be a ferrod. They all end in odd. Um, these are uh, pretty entertaining kinds of soils that are found in mountains of the northern hemisphere in particular, a little bit in the southern hemisphere as well. Um, they tend to be very sandy, not very clay at all, hardly any clay. And they tend to have um, a, um, a horizon that is quite rich in iron or organic matter or, or both. Uh, the vegetation is almost always conifer forest. Uh, conifer forest is a vegetation that is quite strongly um, acidifying. Um, the needles are kept on the tree. Uh, the needles uh, shed uh, phenolic acid, uh, and those phenolic acids um, will leach out uh, the profile itself. So we have an A, that's mineral plus organic. We have an E, that's the alluvial horizon. Almost always is one of these, um, and um, the alluvial is basically the podsol idea. Um, but um, in the U.S. classification, we're not defining it on that. We're um, we're um, defining it on the B.S. or B.H. The spodic horizon. The spodic horizon is cemented with sesquioxides, and those sesquioxides are Fe2O3. Hematite and um, Al2O3, 
um, which is kind of a bermite. Uh, there's hardly any clay in these. They're just simple oxides, and there's very little um, clay at all. Uh, the pH of this whole profile is generally about 3. So any clays that form by weathering of things down in here, um, that clay is uh, destroyed uh, by this um, flux of uh, weathering acid uh, down into, um, into the profile. Um, they are um, quite attractive soil, so they're, they're very sandy. They're not usually very thick. Um, and you see this really strong line of either reddish material, um, reddish brown, or black material, um, which is commonly kind of corroded on the top, but then extends down um, into the material below, um, kind of like a chromatograph, kind of like a column uh, separation of the uh, material. Uh, these are actually pretty striking when you look at them in thin section. In thin section of a spodic horizon, uh, we see um, grains of quartz or feldspar, and around them are these iron and alumina colloids uh, that almost always show radial cracks. They are a thick coating to uh, the grain. Um, now, a spodic horizon has to have a certain amount of iron and alumina enrichment, otherwise it wouldn't be spodic. Uh, but if these um, rinds are a millimeter or so thick um, around uh, the grains, uh, then you can be sure you have a spodic um, horizon. Uh, virtually no clay. Uh, the grains are just uh, loose, um, and the grains are cemented by these colloids, by these um, iron and alumina um, oxides that um, are um, very uh, tough and a hard uh, setting. Uh, you saw an example of this kind of spodic horizon in the lab, um, the ferruginous rhizoconcretions. Um, those were from a spodosol on the Oregon coast. We have a few of these on the Oregon coast um, and a few of them in the high cascades. Um, the place where spodosols are best studied um, is in a, a complex with histosols in um, the British Isles, uh, Scandinavia, uh, parts of northern uh, northern Russia. Uh, the Gondwana countries don't have a lot of them. Um, there are some in the Alps of um, South America uh, and uh, at high elevation in Africa um, around uh, Mount Kenya, Kilimanjaro, and the Ruanzoi Range. Uh, but these are not um, super uh, common um, in the southern hemisphere continents. Uh, they're also not super common in the rock record. Um, we have a few. Um, they go all the way back to the Carboniferous, um, which is interesting, um, but we do not find a lot of them. Um, they are really acidic soils that are relatively um, infertile. They're not much use for agriculture, really. Um, there's very few, there's very little nutrition in this kind of uh, soil. Um, these materials also color the water, a kind of a tea color, uh, which is unpleasant to drink and, and tastes off, tastes kind of rusty. Um, these are um, not really capable of growing vegetables or other things, um, and they're mostly left uh, as watershed protecting soils under uh, conifer forest at fairly high elevation. And they do have a very important role um, in that kind of a, a situation. So, the last one, oxisol. Um, oxisols are deeply weathered tropical uh, soil, and they all end in ox, like orthox, uh, for um, example. Uh, they are quite remarkable uh, soils uh, because they are the end result of a long period of time in warm, tropical, intense um, weathering. The thing about an oxisol uh, profile uh, is that they are thick and deeply weathered. Uh, you find them under um, La Selva, the tropical rainforest of Brazil and Central America. Um, Hawaii is the closest place where we have them, usually multi-tiered forests. 
uh, with several levels of uh, canopy. So they form in a rainforest kind of environment. In a warm climate, um, typically um, four meters at least. Typically we're talking about quite a thick soil, at least 12 feet or so. Um, they can uh, have an A horizon, but that's usually very thin indeed. That's mineral plus organic. And that's because these tropical environments have a tremendous population of um, insects. Tremendous population of insects. Leaf cutter ants, for example. Um, anything that falls out of the trees is cleaned up within minutes by um, uh, insects and fungi in these warm uh, tropical forests. They have hardly any um, leaf litter. Um, they have a very thick clay horizon, uh, which is a BT, but it doesn't show much definition. Uh, it's just clay, um, and there's not too much in the way of um, non-clay material either above or um, below. So this is clay. That's what we call, um, it, it can be argillic or candic. Candic meaning um, it has um, kaolinite. Um, the best way uh, to actually figure out whether you've got an oxisol in the fossil record is to do some geochemistry. And this ratio, CaO plus MgO, these are the oxides that you get in an analysis, plus Na2O plus K2O over Al2O3 is almost zero. Um, everything is shot in these, uh, in these soils. Uh, they have low activity clays um, that um, include uh, kaolinite, um, also um, vermite, which is a bauxite mineral. Bauxite um, is um, one of these uh, soils as well. Uh, there can be a zone of nodules uh, that is um, forming a self-hardening material. That's called a BV equals plinthite, an unusual material you find um, in tropical areas, uh, best known in India. Uh, this plinthite is soft when you dig into it. Um, but if you cut out a brick-sized piece, and you can do that fairly easily, with just a, a machete or a panga, um, and you let it sit and dry out, it forms a brick. Um, these are um, the um, soil horizons that eventually give um, a laterite. Laterite is the um, Latin for brick. Um, in tropical countries, um, you make bricks by excavating uh, this uh, material. Um, we can also um, get the, in these candic environments with a lot of bermine. Um, these are what we call a bauxite, which is an aluminum ore. So you've got very little of these elements and a lot of aluminum. Um, these are actually ores um, that uh, form uh, by uh, deep uh, weathering. Then there's a sea horizon down here, which is weathered. There are some other things about these that are really quite striking as well. Um, these uh, form largely in the zone where there are termites, lots of termites. Um, and it's pretty obvious when you um, make a thin section of one of these that um, there are lots of tiny uh, one to two millimeter rounded pellets of highly oxidized um, material. Um, this is, these are called spherical micropids. And these are basically the aural and fecal pellets of, uh, of termites. It's pretty apparent when you start thin sectioning and, and looking in detail at the textures of these things um, all the way down um, that uh, these soils have gone through the guts of termites several times over. I'm going to put this one in um, parentheses because it's not needed. It's just this thick argillic or candic um, kaolinitic or bromide uh, layer with the very, very low content of nutrient elements that is um, a characteristic of um, oxisols. Oxisols are pretty difficult to use agriculturally, although people are finding a way. Um, 
Native Americans in Brazil, for example, have a system uh, which is called a Swidden system. Um, and what they do is they uh, cut down uh, about, a, about a hectare, about 100 meters by 100 meter patch in the rainforest, uh, and then they burn it, burn the whole thing. So they fertilize the upper surface um, with the ash of that material. They cultivate that um, with root crops um, and, and maize uh, for maybe 20 years. Uh, and then they just abandon it and let the forest uh, take over. Um, these soils have a very low natural fertility. Once the ash from burning the forest has been um, dispersed and carried off in, in crops, it's, 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 it's no good. The other problem, of course, is you get down to this level, the plinthite. Um, if you expose that with um, erosional gullies or in some other way, then the soil will tend to form a hard setting crust. Um, which is very difficult for roots to find any purchase in at all. Uh, these soils are impenetrable and they, they dry to the consistency of um, bricks. So um, commercial agriculture of the large scale that is now being widely practiced in Brazil um, has been rather unsuccessful in using these soils compared to the native system of Sweden where you just cultivate a, short, a small patch um, bit by bit. Um, there's some indication also uh, that um, the indigenous people of Brazil um, fertilized their uh, soils with charcoal and other materials, not just the ash of burning the forest, but also created uh, charcoal to make a kind of a soil called a loma prieta, um, which is found uh, around and in um, a number of archaeological sites in the Amazon um, and the Amazon um, basin. Uh, we don't have to deal with too many of, of these oxisols um, in the northern hemisphere. However, in the fossil record we have evidence in many levels that uh, sometimes these oxisols came all the way north into Oregon and all the way south into Sydney, Australia. In the Middle Miocene, for example, uh, there is an oxisol that you can still see uh, in the Salem Hills of Oregon. It's an oxisol that formed uh, between two flows of the Middle Miocene Columbia River Basalt Group at about 16 million years ago. Uh, it's about four to five meters thick, deeply, deeply weathered, and it indicates a greenhouse spike when uh, tropical ecosystems went all the way north in the Wild Valley, as far north as Vancouver, Washington, not Vancouver, British Columbia, but Vancouver, Washington. Uh, in Sydney, too, um, we have mainly um, the spodosols and uh, ultrasols um, forming now in Sydney at about 35 degrees south. But uh, 16 million years ago, there were these huge lateritic oxisols that formed uh, and are still there in the beaches. Uh, these appear to be very brief uh, greenhouse crises that introduced this tropical weathering uh, into temperate um, latitudes. And it's a very interesting to think how the spread of these ecosystems with their strongly weathering vegetation uh, and warmth and moisture um, was really pretty instrumental in curbing greenhouse excesses, greenhouse excesses of greenhouse carbon dioxide that came from large volcanic eruptions like the Miocene Columbia uh, River uh, basalt. So that's it. That's all 12 um, of the orders of um, the soil survey staff, the so-called soil uh, taxonomy. Um, I'd like you to memorize them all, uh, at least have a bit of a profile concept of each one. And I think you'll find um, knowledge of soil taxonomy will be very helpful uh, in the case when you become a consulting geologist or are interested in using a soil survey map, a county survey map, to um, make the best use of your own property. And that'll do it. Thank you.